Washington is no longer the capital of the United States. It is the capital of the world. This city on the Potomac has long arms reaching into every corner of the globe. This is the home of the Foreign Service. Here they are, the men and women of what Washington calls the Silent Service. These Foreign Service officers have been tortured, maimed, stricken by disease, disaster, and death. Yet how many know the office of the Foreign Service of the United States? How many of us have seen this plaque, which tells an eloquent story, directed by members of the American Foreign Service Association, in honor of diplomatic and consular officers of the United States, who, while on active duty, lost their lives under heroic or tragic circumstances. And for those who think the State Department is filled only with blue bloods, here are a few Americans whose forebears were not on the Mayflower. Our story begins in Peiping, our most important post in northern China. Here, not too long ago, a significant incident occurred, one of a series of such events which brought on the present crisis in that area. Our Peiping Consulate General was once an embassy, which is our top-ranking representation abroad. Then it became a legation, when the capital of China was moved to Nanking. Now it's a consulate general of even less diplomatic importance on the official books. But actually, Peiping is one of our few important listening posts in turbulent North China. A vice consul just brought in restricted and top secret mail. A consul general doesn't handle it all himself. In a large consulate general, he couldn't. That's why he has a staff of vice consuls assistants and attachés, each an expert in a specialized field. Like any other business, the government business of maintaining representation in a foreign land is a complicated one. The consul is concerned with vital statistics. Here, he registers a birth to an American couple. He sometimes is present at weddings of his countrymen, of which he officially takes note. Here is an American citizen, a fur buyer, who spends lonely months on trading expeditions into North China. During his travels, he has picked up some information which he feels is valuable to his country. has gotten to the Consul General, who naturally is anxious to learn what his voluntary informant knows. Patriotic Americans often keep in touch with their consulates. Storm's brewing up there. You'd better come with me. I thought it best for him not to come to the consulate. Well, that's wise. We never can tell when someone may be watching. His tongue's been cut out. The second victim. Exactly the same pattern. Yes, and they were both very valuable to us in keeping us informed about conditions in the north. Looks like they got whatever report he had. I don't like the way things are shaping up. The way the Iron Curtain's being lowered between us and the north. Transasiatic transport suspended all flights. Guerrillas have been reported just outside the city. It all adds up to something very important. I think I'd better inform Washington. Right, the situation is beginning to follow a pattern. Not many listening posts left up there, and we can't afford not to know what goes on. We need more help. May have to call on you for another man. Well, I think I'll have the right man for you, providing he keeps up the good work. 
going through his training right now. Good. You know what we want. Send in the file on uh, Kenneth Seeley. Mr. Seeley, you've undoubtedly heard much criticism about our methods of court-martial. What do you think of our system? Well, sir, as an ex-enlisted man in the United States Marine Corps, I have some pretty positive ideas on that subject. Please be frank. Well, since we're entitled to a trial by a jury of our peers, the court-martial board, in the case of the enlisted defendant, should consist of enlisted men as well as officers. Now, suppose you tell us who has the treaty-making power in the United States? The, uh, the President, but it must be ratified by the Senate. Now, Mr. Seeley, what was the main French supply of fuel during the last war? This is a stiff oral test Ken is taking, a test not many people could pass. But not only is his knowledge examined, his method of answering the questions, his poise, his ability to improvise are all taken into consideration. For Ken Seeley, as a Foreign Service officer, will represent the United States in some corner of the world, and his authority must be unquestioned. Oh, I'm Excuse sorry. Me. <laughs> Hello. Were you uh, taking an exam, too? No, not quite. I was just waiting for a decision. Oh, about being a Foreign Service officer? Well, not exactly. I asked for a special job. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Miss... Uh, uh... Margaret Walden. How do you do? I'm Ken Seeley. How do you do? I'm a would-be Foreign Service officer. I just went through the third degree. Same here. I tried to sell my chief on a new idea. Oh? Well, why don't you tell me about it over lunch? Well, I don't know. I, well, I'm just following instructions, Miss Walden. I was told to go someplace and relax, and I was never very good at relaxing alone. Well, why don't you invite me and see what happens? Well, you're invited, ma'am. I know just the place, too. It's across the Potomac. Well, I, I think I ought to go home and freshen up a bit. Well, fine. I'll pick you up in about an hour. I'll be ready. Oh, wait, wait, Miss Walden. Oh, Miss Walden, what's your address? Where do I pick you up? Number six, Barney Circle, Southeast. Number six, Barney Circle, Southeast. Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. I'm awfully glad you overcame my womanly reserve and whisked me off to lunch. It was a tough fight, but the victory was well worth the struggle. Maybe an expensive victory. Don't tell me I'm in the clutches of a mercenary female. No, but a hungry one. You know what prices are now. Are you looking for something? If you're going to be such an expensive date, I may need that dollar that Washington tossed over the Potomac. Oh, you're too late. The income tax men beat you to it a long time ago. I love places like this. I haven't lived very long in Washington, but somehow it seems like home to me. I thought you modern gals preferred those distant romantic places. <laughs> distant romantic places. They usually mean dirt, heat, gnats, and most everything except comfort. <laughs> you know, you sound like an ex-Marine, too. Tell me about your assignment, or is that top secret? No. Just isn't very easy to explain. Do you care for anything else? No, nothing else right now, thank you. What makes it so hard to explain? Well, it's a matter of morale. I spent two or three dismal years in posts in the East and the Near East, and most difficult problem of all was what to do with your spare time if you were a gal. <laughs> no, I mean it. Men can much more easily adapt themselves to a rough life than a girl can. Delicate creatures. <laughs> Tell me about yourself. How did you happen to choose the Far Eastern Service? 
chose me. I was born in Mongolia. My parents were missionaries. Mine are dirt farmers in Iowa. But you used the word were in, in referring to your parents, are they? And they were murdered by Mongolian bandits. Oh, horrible. It was, but it happened when I was pretty young. I never had any urge to be a missionary, but it occurred to me in being with the State Department why maybe I could help to carry on the work that they gave their lives for. Passing the stiff written and oral examinations was just the first step in becoming a Foreign Service officer. Now he must go through an intensive course of indoctrination, learning Foreign Service history and customs, cryptology and the preparing and unraveling of codes, language, ports and exports, commerce, shipping, visas, international law, psychology, and all the various subjects that add up to diplomacy. A full day in the Institute is not enough. At home... Sigley, I'm assigning you to Beiping. You'll be the language officer. Your knowledge of Mongolian will be valuable. Tell me you speak like a native now. Thank you, sir. Now, that entire North China country is a hotbed of revolution and intrigue caused by outside influences. They've made a concerted effort to rid the territory of all Americans. Our nationals have been threatened, spirited mysteriously away, even murdered. Now, you know what we expect of you. You've got to be the eyes and ears of the United States. Good luck. Goodbye, sir. What a perfect day. Uh-huh. Well, what a long face. <laughs> I was just thinking that saying goodbye to you isn't going to be easy. It doesn't make me happy either. Well, I always get a tug of emotion when I look at the Lincoln Memorial, don't you? Always. The Washington Monument, too. The lives of two great men dedicated to the freedom for all men. Doesn't it make you feel proud to know that our work is a part of all this? A very little part. <laughs> of course, that goes for the other 140 million Americans, too, Marge. What's the bonus, fellas? Stay away from those bras and stock <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you for the iron curtain, gentlemen. Okay. to your quarters. I'm sure you'll be a welcome addition to the consulate. I hope so, sir. Wing, will you show Mr. Seeley to his rooms, please? Yes, sir. And you will soon be launched into the social world. Receptions such as these seem like the pleasant side of a consul's work. Actually, they are difficult and exacting. For while representatives of friendly nations meet here in these beautiful, peaceful gardens of the Consulate General, 
There are also officials present from countries that are not too friendly. Oh, Mr. Hote, I'd like you to meet my new language officer, Kenneth Seeley. How do you do? Mr. Seeley will be attached to this post and will probably see a good deal of you. It will be a pleasure, Mr. Seeley. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've met almost everybody. Uh, business as usual. Excuse me. The skilled foreign service officer must keep his eyes and ears open, for he can never tell when information might come his way. Information valuable to his country. China is being strangled. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing compared to what it will be, honorable brother, when our great warlord, the hereditary prince of his sacred father, the Khan, when Marshal Yen Yu Shu marches again. Again, again, Yu Chi Mingu to Turun. I would be honored to use the language of most, although you speak your language beautifully. Like a native. Well, thank you, but I am a native. I was born in Mongolia. What a surprise. In Mongolia? Indeed. Where were you born? Not far from Mingu. Do you know the town? Yes. It's the birthplace of a very famous Mongolian, Marshal Yanu Su. By the way, whatever became of the Marshal? He disappeared so mysteriously after the Chinese central government banished him from his province. I have not heard of the Marshal for many, many years. It is rumored that he is dead. I'm sorry, we must leave. Don't you? Yes, it might have been the liquor talking, and then again, it might not. Mongolians are apt to be boastful in their cups, and they're not used to our fiery Western liquor. <laughs> well, now it's beginning to add up. The murder of those Americans and the... Uh... Which was never solved. Well, sir, whatever is brewing, it must concern Mingu and Marshal Yanu Su. And, of course, the State Department. Yanu Su, that's a sinister name in North China. His father was the old school of warlord, you know, fire and sword, take everything, give nothing. Fortunately, he died during the plague. But this Yanu Su is a very smooth article. Yes, I'd say it was a highly explosive situation. I was here during the anti-foreign riots of 1922. I sincerely hope that no irresponsible leader starts another massacre. Why, you were the victim of one yourself. Yes, my parents. Must have made a terrible impression on you as a child. It did. For a long time, I never wanted to come back to China. Now, I'm glad I'm back. Maybe it's because I have a feeling of unfinished business. Something I have to see through. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Yes? Yes? Oh, I'll be right there. That was the chief of police. He wants us to identify two bodies, Mongolians. Says he has reason to believe they were at our reception this afternoon. Thank you for coming, sir. They are under the covers. If you don't mind? Not at all. Well, it's the same men who were at your party. The men who talk too much. Ah, that explains it. What? Cut out. Come on, Ken. Go, go, go.
Here's my report, sir. Oh, thanks. I'll send it along with mine. Uh, sit down a moment. I sent a summary of the situation to Washington. When I talked to the ambassador at Nanking this morning, he asked me to. Well, what does he think? He thinks it may be serious, just as we do. Uh, say, I don't like that window episode last night. You might have been killed. Yes, I know. It wouldn't be so good for the government. They'd be out the cost of my training. Well, it's nothing to do but wait. We'll hear from Washington soon enough. <clears throat> Cigarettes, sir? No, no, no thanks. Kenneth Seeley will be attached to Mingu Consulate as Vice Consul. He will proceed at once, but not give the impression of haste. Suggested he take the next plane carrying diplomatic courier. This is a tough assignment, Seeley. If the trouble going on up there spills over, you'll have to be the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps all rolled into one. But anyway, get at the bottom of what's going on. I understand, sir. And above all, be diplomatic. The Chinese government does not want to antagonize that province, which is still loyal. How often does the plane make the trip to Mingo? Uh, once a month, but you'll be expected to get word back by any means possible, even carrier pigeon if you have to. <laughs> You'd better write a full report on this rickshaw incident for the ambassador. Yes, sir. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Reither, but they want you in the radio room right away. I'll be right there. You might as well come along. That main going away fan, sir. Johnny Hunt, sir. Radio operator. Oh, yes. Anything important? He say he no main go get new vice consul very soon. What? How did he learn that? Your orders were received in secret code. Uh, ask Johnny Hunt how he knows. How do you find out about the vice consul? This Johnny Han, Ming Gu. Our cook tell us we get new vice consul from Pei Ping. Cook say he hear it in market. Market say he hear it in wholesale house. Wholesale house say he hear it from traveler, but do not remember who. Mm, there it is again, the traveler. That strange nomadic creature who always starts the rumors and who is always so amazingly right. What would the Foreign Service do without him? Thanks, Lang. Very happy, sir. Well, this would explain the rickshaw incident. Well, they're certainly keeping tabs on me, whoever they are. They're keeping tabs on everybody. It's a highly efficient spy network. It might mean that the marshal's about ready to start. Bags aboard, please. Hello, Logan. Hello. Meet Vice Consul Seeley. How do you do? How do you do? Did you have a nice trip? Oh, rough in spots. Didn't bother me any, but I think our other passenger wasn't too happy. Mark! 
surprise. Oh, don't care. Oh, what a surprise. I thought you were at Ankara. I was in Ankara, but only for one week. And then I got my orders to move on. Where? Mingu. I was afraid of that. Oh, you just don't want me hanging around. No, no it isn't that. Nothing in the world would make me happier except that except I... Except that Mingu is dangerous. It isn't the safest place in the world. Well, we wanted to be in the service. <laughs> Marge, this is Mr. Wright. Your old friend. Hello, Mr. Wright. Nice to see you again, Marge. Nice to see you again, sir. She was my clerk at Darien. Uh, that was your first post, wasn't it, Marge? Yes, it was. Uh, I'm sorry you can't stay with us for a while. So am I. I'd welcome a chance to get my land legs back again. It was a rough trip. Oh, <laughs> let's you and I walk around a while. You might as well take advantage of the ground. It's a long trip to Mingu. Right oh. Oh, uh, by the way, uh... Don't take off without us, Sealy. You haven't a chance. Isn't it risky sending a woman to that territory? Oh, my dear boy, there are several American women there already, and that's why she's being sent. Anyway, Marge can take care of herself. I happen to know. Logan, you're always a welcome sight. I got lots of stuff for you this trip, Consul. Better send Johnny back with a few men to help us unload. As soon as we take our guests to the Consul. I'm Consul Howard Brown. And you, I presume, are Margaret Walden? Yes, sir. How do and you? you're my new Vice Consul. Ken Seeley. Welcome to Mangu, such as it is. They're all waiting over at the Consulate to meet you both. Let's pile into the Jeep. Johnny, get a couple of boys and go out to the airport and bring that stuff back. Yes, sir. I want you all to meet Margaret Walden and Kenneth Seeley of the Foreign Service. Mr. Seeley will be my new vice consul. This is Mrs. Brown. How do you Hello, do, Mrs. Mr. Brown. Brown. The Reverend Dr. Morse and Mrs. Morse. How do you How do? You do? Doctor, how are you? And that wide-eyed little girl is Jessica Morse. And Jessica will be relieved to learn that the plane brought all the back issues of the Sunday comics and some bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> A girl does get behind in her Dick Tracy out here, doesn't she? Yes, ma'am, and Buck Rogers, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is our most eligible bachelor, Miss Walden, Mr. Wilfred Bollinger, British American Tobacco. How do you do, sir? This is a surprise. And Kenneth Seeley. Yes. Yes, of course. How are you, old man? Fine. Nice to see you. Well, there goes my corner on bachelor eligibility. And there's Carrie. I had a most difficult time getting her away from her desk. Oh, yes. I've read a report on her. Difficult, is she? Not always. Originally, she was fine. A hard worker. A woman who entered into the spirit of things. Now she's withdrawn into herself. Tense. Neurotic. I suspect she cries more than is good for her. Maybe she needs a good woman to woman talk. I'll do my best. I'll introduce you. Carrie, I want you to meet Margaret Walden from Washington. My replacement. You want Washington for another clerk? How could you do that, sir? Not at all, Miss Willoughby. I'm just here on a visit. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll leave you two ladies alone. Excuse me. Needs a tuning, doesn't it? You didn't come here to take my job, did you? I'd hate to leave. A failure. I'd kill myself first. Oh, you'd do nothing of this sort. Besides, you're decidedly not a failure. As a matter of fact, this happens to be a post where the clerical work is quite superior. Is it? 
Is that what they think in Washington? Well, I'm afraid you'd be very conceited if I told you all the nice things I've heard about your work. So you see? Really? Thank you. <laughs> I think you'll find this comfortable, Celie. Johnny Hahn will look after you. Your office. Well, this is all very nice, sir. How do the women manage? Well, Carrie lives with the Morses. Miss Walton will have a spare room in their house. You'll be here alone with Johnny and his flock of invisible servants. I never did find out just how many he's got. Don't be alarmed if you're awakened by the most harrowing, squealing and squeaking noises. Johnny's a radio ham and will get up at all hours to communicate with such maniacs. I imagine it comes in handy insofar as keeping in touch with the, uh, the outside world is concerned. Yeah. He should be able to pick up some pretty valuable information, too. On the contrary, there's a peculiar, ominous quiet over the territory. I can't put my finger on it, but I can feel it. It worries me because this town is the only listening post we have left in the territory. A wave of aggression might be brewing, and we wouldn't find out about it until it's too late. Well, you're tired. We'll discuss it more thoroughly at dinner. Yes, sir. For this Jeep, we might be living in the times of Genghis Khan. Except for those firearms. Yes, yes, the caravans have been carrying some pretty modern weapons lately. Automatics, machine guns. They say it's better protection against the bandits. that man on the horse, the one wearing a peaked hat? Oh, yeah. What about him? I wouldn't swear to it, but I think I saw him at the consular party at Pei Bing. I wonder what he's doing here. I don't know, but we'll find out soon enough. Well, we'd better get to the field and see Logan off.
XU9. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mr. Ken. Hey, it's a nice little set you have here. Yes, sir. Not very big, but it worked. We four, sometime even Moscow. Oh, you hear anything interesting? No, sir. I hope. Say, incidentally, did you ever track down the rumor about my coming here? The one that leaked out over the grapevine? Oh, no, sir. Do you know where the man is that told it? Yes, sir. Drive me over. I want to talk to him. Right away. Right away. Yes, when caravan come to town, town is jumping. Awesome, like they say over radio. <laughs> Oh, yes, sir. He also chief elder of council, or same uh, mayor of city. Big shot, eh? <laughs> this honorable vice council, Mr. Kenneth Seeley, from American Consulate. Mr. Wontop. How do you do? I'm honored, sir. I understand you knew I was coming here before it was officially announced. Do you mind telling me how you found out about it? Marketplace, sir. From whom? I don't remember now. I think it was from a traveler, perhaps a fur buyer from the south. Traveler from the south, huh? Yes, sir. One who is mayor of this town, you have access to more information than anyone else, isn't that true? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Well, tell me. Before the caravan arrived, did you notice any strange elements, things happening that, well, that hadn't taken place before? Oh, please think that over very carefully. It's important. I can only say, sir, that I have had a very uneasy feeling. Why? Because there have been too many strangers here lately. But you still can't tell me where that rumor originated. Left her hoof in this. <laughs> ah, you know, go touch that. Jessica's joined the caravan. <laughs> time for us to leave here. I'm afraid it is. Excuse us, please. Yes. I know. Mm. 
<laughs> You've done a good day's work, Jessica. Now we better go home. Oh, gee. Right when he was going to teach me how to eat fire. Hi, Castle. Miss Castle. Carrie, Mr. Ballinger. Bill and Sneed. I know this caravan would flush you out. Yeah, well, I hope they brung plenty of furs with them because they got plenty of silver dollars. Bill, meet Margaret Walden, Kenneth Seeley, Kansas, new vice consul. Hello. Bill's the original Yankee trader. They say he landed here in China Clipper days with a pocket full of wooden nutmegs, and he's been trading ever since. Oh, now, look, I ain't quite that old, but I'm dang near it. Say, how about locking up my money bags for me? Glad to do it, Bill. Peggy and I were just leaving anyway. Don't you boys and girls stay out too late. We won't. Come on. Oh, darling, I had such fun tonight. So did I. Remind me never to drink kumis again, would you? <laughs> you know, watching that caravan was like wandering through history. That's a very impressive statement, Miss W. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Age-old transportation, camels, oxen. Yes, I know. Right alongside of them, natives riding on bicycles. And wasn't Jessica cute for that Chinese bubblegum <laughs> class? <laughs> Aside from that, nothing seems to have changed in a thousand years. I know something else that hasn't changed either. I hope it never does. Good night, Doc. the informal gathering so early. There seems to be some sort of misunderstanding. Maybe the boys had too much party last night. <laughs> Carrie. Carrie, don't let them see you do that. Where's Marge? She's been detained for questioning. It seems the caravan was the advance guard. Who, Marshal Yanosu? Yes, our friend has finally arrived. He has arrived in the step.
Kaisi Wadi Fani, her Kuan, Colonel Aram. Delighted, Consul Brown. Delighted. I am, as the Marshal explained, his official interpreter and aide. How do you do? Has he been uh, disagreeable? The Marshal hates American women. He told me so through his interpreter. He claims that American women don't know how to make love. Well, I'm glad of that anyway. Has the Marshal forgotten all his English during his long stay in Mongolia? It's been rumored he was once a brilliant scholar at Oxford. My dear Consul, the Marshal does not like that barbarian tongue. That is sufficient. I see. Will my boy be permitted to brew us all some coffee? Ling Shir Dao Jing Joffi. May you chi Zhou Chan. Do it, but chi. Dala. The Marshal begs me to convey his apologies. It was very thoughtless of him not to provide you with some breakfast. I would enjoy a cup myself. That's been a long time since I've had a cup of good American coffee. Thank you. Johnny. Will you prepare a light breakfast for all of us with plenty of coffee? Yes, sir. Ching Cho. Please sit down, everybody. Yes, sir. The Marshal regrets the inconvenience, but it will be necessary for the Americans and Mr. Ballinger to remain in the consulate night and day. Nothing will be touched. No one will be harmed if his orders are obeyed implicitly. There will be a guard around the consulate until we decide to withdraw. And when will that be, Colonel? Maybe one week, maybe two weeks. The Marshal, of course, realizes he's on American soil when he enters this property. Ling Sher, sir. This is Mongolian soil, Consul. My father was prince of this province. I was forced into exile, but now I'm back. For a week or two? Perhaps, or... Oh, perhaps to stay. Yeah, let go of me. Say, you can't do this to me. I'm an American citizen. Hurry! This man goo. Hello, Nanking. This man goo. Marshal, you must tell us how long you expect to keep us prisoners. The women will be particularly uncomfortable. Besides, what's the purpose behind this capture of innocent American citizens? You're not going to make yourself very popular with the United States. You'd better think. As you Americans say, nice try, Sealy. I heard that radio. I'm gone. I knocked on lie. The Marshal is very angry. He has broken your radio. Now, to make sure that it cannot be fixed and used by your radio operator, he has given me another order. Dina Run, Dao, Tian Fang. Just a minute. This man is in the consulate employ. He's under the protection of the American flag. Leave him alone. Kung Tao! Kung Ming Chung Bi! Tell it true! When the Marshal gives an order, it is obeyed.
go in there, please. I'm a doctor. The Marshal is very annoyed at what has happened. He is now returning to headquarters. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, no one will be hurt. Nothing will be touched if... if our orders are obeyed implicitly. Joba! Wait. Better let Reverend Morris go in first. May I take Sarah with me? If you think you should. Come along, Sarah. The vice consul insists upon seeing you. He's outside, under guard, of course. Shen Mo Dung Si, Tai Tai, come in, Sili. May we have permission to bury Johnny Han in the cemetery near the mission? No, Seeley. I'm sorry. But what objection could he possibly have? Perhaps he doesn't want any of you to leave the consulate. Well, then would you be kind enough to send for one or the undertaker? We can have the body cremated and buried in the gardens outside the consulate. If the marshal doesn't object, I'll see to it that Wanto visits you this afternoon. Thank you. I assume. They are. May I ask why? The Marshal suspects some of them as being traitors. Traitors? Yes. If you remember, the Chinese government denounced the Marshal and a price put on his head. But why pick on these poor, helpless natives? They were not picked haphazardly, I assure you. We've had them investigated a long time before we came. Oh, I see. Well, what do you intend to do with them? The Marshal will conduct his own court of inquiry. Colonel, I think the Marshal will use any excuse to conduct a reign of terror. Silly, you would do well to keep such opinions to yourself. Please march. After you cremate him, Wanto, return the ashes here to the consulate. We'll bury them in the garden. 
Yes, honorable sir. I will place his remains in one of our best urns. You will be satisfied. Wanto, you're a member of the Council of Elders here in Mingu. Do you approve of what the Marshal is doing? No, honorable sir. I do not. He's stirring up much trouble, and some of my people have uh, disappeared. We are great worried, but we don't know what to do. Wato, were you present when they rounded up the people who disappeared? <laughs> yes. Once at the tea room, and once I watched from behind the curtains of my shop, the soldiers came, drag out innocent men. Did you see the man who pointed them out? He was a tall Eurasian, a strange-looking man from the north, came with a caravan. Yes, yes. I saw him, and I wondered who he was. He's the marshal's spy. Watch out for him. Good. Is there anything else? Yes. Can you get us any firearms? All the firearms have been collected. Besides, they would be impossible to smuggle in. I was afraid of that. Mr. Brown, didn't you say dynamite was used to clear the landing field? Yes, there's some left in the warehouse. Can you get us some sticks? The warehouses are all guarded by the marshal's soldiers, but I will try. Get them as soon as possible, will you? I will do my best. Then I will return with the ashes. What's on your mind, Ken? I'm not sure yet, but with a few sticks of dynamite, and if things get worse... Well, things I... are getting worse. The Marshal's campaign has begun. It looks like a sort of squeeze play. Yes, I know. He's obviously using us in his dirty game of politics. If the Generalissimo gives him the nod and lets him have his province, why, he'll deliver us unharmed. Yeah, which will make him a hero. Exactly. And if he's refused, he'll turn us over as hostages to his friends in the North. And that'll make him a hero to them. Just an old warlord custom, playing both ends against the middle. And we're definitely in the middle. Well, let's take a look at that radio set. Well, there's a possibility these condensers and coils might work, but it's useless without tubes. He apparently overlooked the receiver. We can at least hear Nanking and Peiping. What the Marshal doesn't realize is that our radio silence will eventually arouse the suspicion of the embassy. I was thinking the same thing. But with things happening as fast as they are, eventually it might be too late. Dear. The Marshal has just finished a private court of inquiry into so-called traitors. He's condemned 20 men to death, including the brother of our kitchen helper. 20 men? How awful. I'm afraid that's only the beginning. That transmitter. Those tubes don't fit. Come in, Mingo. Come in, Mingo. Come in, Mingo. Come in, Mingo. This is the American Embassy in Nanking. Come in, please. Come in, Mingo. Calling the consulate at Mingo. Embassy at Nanking. Calling the consulate at Mingo. Come in, please. 
Come in, Mingu. Nanking calling Mingu. Hello, hello, Peiping. Last report from Johnny Han said he was going off the air to change tubes and make adjustments. He's had time to repair his set. Something may be wrong. If we don't hear from the Mingu consulate within 24 hours, we will send plane to investigate. We do not wish a plane to come here. Can anyone fix the radio so that it will transmit? He's the only one in the consulate. And how about you? I never did know very much about radio. I think you are lying, and I have ways of finding out the truth. Send for Amgor. Wait a minute. I think I can fix the radio if there were some more tubes available. Do you know whether there are any extra tubes? There might be some in the warehouse. All right. You look for them with a guard. urn with the ashes, honorable sir. Thank you. You're late. We were worried. We were late because we have filled the request of the other honorable gentleman. Johnny Hong has not died in vain. That's fine, Wanto. Take it out to the garden. Heavenly Father, we commend to thy care the soul of Johnny Hahn, the noble spirit of one of thy children who died in agony like thy son, so that we on earth might take courage and inspiration from his sacrifice. May he rest in peace. Amen. 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 Remember me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take off without you. Ken, there's something on your mind. I know it's none of my business, but... Well, I worry about you. Why, Marge? Well, I have a hunch you're planning something crazy. You and the consul have been thicker than thieves, whispering in corners. What's it all about? Well, we're just trying to anticipate the marshal's next move. Then? And it doesn't look good. What are you going to do about it? Well, stop and let possible. Can I? I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. You want to know something? What? Neither would I. stop playing, Miss Walden. It was very beautiful and very melancholy. I love beautiful and melancholy things. Our business now is with Consul Brown and Vice Consul Seeley. We bought you all the radio tubes we could find. Some of them must fit. These won't work. And Johnny Hahn changed over the set of special sizes required. These are old ones. Besides, they're no good anyway. If a plane is sent here, 
It will be shot down. There will be more planes. If they get to be a nuisance, we know how to be a bigger nuisance. Unless... Unless what? Unless the Chinese central government meets my terms. And may I inquire what those terms are? I shall set up a government here. With yourself as prince? My father was the prince. His title and prerogatives are hereditary. And would the prince maintain a government here for the people? Or would he play ball with his friends in the north? That is his affair. Well, suppose he's turned down by the Chinese central government. They will be very sorry. They will not only lose the province, but the marshal's valued friendship. I would like very much to query Nanking on that. So would we. But how? I think I know where there are some tubes. Judging by the antenna, there's a large radio set in the marshal's trailer. Those tubes might very well fit this set. Can they be replaced in his radio after they are used? Certainly. Very well. You will make the change. I'll, uh, I'll have to get my tools. It's a pretty nice house on wheels the marshal's got for himself. Who built it for him? Who do you suppose? Please hurry. This thing must be uh, grounded on the frame. I'll uh, have to disconnect the batteries from underneath. It'll short out the entire circuit if I don't. Go ahead. This is XU-8 Mingu calling Nanking XU-9. This is XU-8 Mingu calling Nanking XU-9. Come in, Mingu. This is Nanking. Come in, Mingu. Tell them all is well here. Nothing else. Understand? Hello, Nanking. This is Vice Consul Ken Seeley. Sorry to be off the air so long, but we had radio trouble. Very glad to hear from you, Seeley. We were getting ready to send a plane. Where's Johnny Hahn? Johnny Han is, is sick. That accounts for some of the radio delay. Everything is fine here. Does the ambassador have any instructions? Nanking wants a complete report. The ambassador is worried. What's he worried about? Seems like Marshal Yunusu has been reported on the move. There's a rumor he's invading his father's province, trying to force Nanking to accept him as governor. That's interesting. Very interesting. How does Nanking feel about it? The Chinese government refuses to dicker with the marshal. They say he's a traitor and orders are to kill or capture him on sight. Is that all, Marshal? That's all. That's enough. Now tell them that the marshal is a very difficult man to capture. Well, if I do that, suppose Tell them. I... 
What was that? Who's there? Did you say Marshal? Is that Marshal Unisu? We don't like this silence. Something's up. Are you talking under duress? Answer us. Is Marshal Unisu there? No. Now remove the tubes and replace them in my trailer. Marshal's waiting for you. What for? This country belongs to my illustrious family, and I have been more than patient with you. You will all learn how I reward any stupid attempt to make a fool of me. What's happened? The Marshal has been predicting what might happen to us. It seems that little slip of yours on the air distressed him very much. You will not feel so amused, Mr. Brown, when you learn my decision. I, I admit that this is a setback, but a temporary one, I assure you. Perhaps the Chinese government will send bombers after me, so I must leave at once. But I will be back with bombers of my own. And now you will please all get ready for a long journey. Hurry. Time is of the essence. Just a minute, Marshal. We have your promise that everyone would remain unharmed. Is the great Prince Yanusu going back on his word? Only if my orders were followed. They were not. They were followed to the letter by everyone here but me. I was the one who made the, the mistake of saying Marshal on the air. That was no mistake. All right, Mr. Seeley. I will keep my promise. You want to take the blame for everybody. You want to be a hero. Excellent. I like heroes. Therefore, I will take you along with me on my trip. As a matter of fact, it would be a good idea. You can be my safe conduct to my destination by remaining at my side every minute. Seely is not only an American citizen. He's an officer in the Foreign Service of the United States. So? Do you expect me to completely ignore the fact that I have been tricked by this man? You know me better than that, Consul. I'll take Mr. Seeley along, and believe me, he'll get excellent care from me. However, I cannot guarantee what the Chinese government may do. If they want to send their planes to bomb me, naturally, they will bomb Mr. Seeley, too. You can tell them that if they stop off here first, and I'm sure they will, Mr. Brown. And another thing, I would suggest that you be very discreet of everything you do or say. You will be watched closely. I suggest you get ready, Mr. Seeley. Do you mind if I pack a few clothes? By all means. And be prepared for a long, long journey. very proud of me now, would he? Yeah, the director general isn't in love with you either. Ken, I can't help being terribly frightened for you. This thing isn't as bad as it looks. Besides, I think the marshal's bluffing anyway. Incidentally, tell the council that some of those discarded tubes do fit so we can talk to Dan King. Soft. Traveling first class that way. I always was like. 
Goodbye, sir. Good luck, Ken. I don't need it. Little did I know when I planted that dynamite in the trailer that I was going to be in it, too. to stop? One of those bombers may stop you, Marshal. Not when they learn that you're taking the trip with me. You see, the difference between people like you and me and Aram here. Americans are sentimentalists. They wouldn't have you harmed for anything in the world. But as for me, I wouldn't hesitate a moment. Nor would the colonel. After all, you're not important. Just another vice consul. There are many in your foreign service. But I am a prince. And the world may again face another conqueror from Mongolia. It took 700 years for the Mongols to develop another potential... Genghis Khan. Thank you. Perhaps if you died, it would take 700 years to develop another threat to world peace here. You're a dangerous man, Marshal. Yes, and even you don't know how dangerous. You see, Mr. Seeley, you forced my hand with that radio trick. I was going to take my time, look the situation over, Perhaps get what I wanted by peaceful means. Peaceful means? Yes. The Mongolians are my people. They would have seen it my way after a while. Now I will have to declare war openly. Maybe I'll make that prediction come true. The one about the golden hordes of the East overrunning the earth. They're waiting for me now up north. An army with full equipment. Tanks, artillery, bombers. All I have to do is give the word. You mean they won't march without you? No. I am their leader. Without me, they're nothing but a rabble. Without a plan or purpose. You know you're right, Marshal. I am just a vice-consul, dime a dozen. 
If I die, there are lots of others to take my place. If you die, there's no one else to take your place. Exactly. When we reach your camp, what happens to me up there? The colonel seems amused. Let's all have a good time. Why not turn on the radio? Colonel Aram here likes melancholy music. Good idea. I was wondering if that radio was fixed. So you did not fix it? That seems a very petty thing to do. Let me take a look at it. Here's the trouble. I forgot to reconnect the battery wire. A smart man like you should have been on the winning side. I am on the winning side, Marshal. I represent an ideology that recognizes the... the dignity of the individual. That holds all men to be free and equal under God. You represent murder and rape and slavery in the name of the law. You're a mad dog that must and will be destroyed. You're a fool to speak to me like that!